So welcome to this webinar. We will get started and underway very shortly. But in the meantime, uh, please use the chat in the sidebar to tell us who you are and where you come from. And uh, we'll get started in a couple of minutes. Hello from the Netherlands. That's very close to where I'm from, actually. I'm originally from Germany. Greetings from Phoenix. Malaysia. Great to, oh, great to see where everybody tunes yeah. in. So we're already all over the planet. That's great. I like that. <laughs> Finland, Texas, Austin. Couple of, a few in Texas. United Canada. States. You're going to have to be more specific there now. That's a, <laughs> that's a big place. London, that's a close one. Very good. Yeah. We're we're in Ireland, some of us at least. Luxembourg, yeah. Australia, Manchester, Egypt, Luxembourg again, Sweden. Lots from India, India as usual. Always great to see. Nigeria, New Zealand. Yeah, it's late, late for you lot over there, or very early actually, I should say. Right. Welcome. What time is it in New Zealand over there for you? <laughs> Malaysia is not is also pretty far away in terms of time zone so yeah so well I am that's dedication and thank okay. you so much for spending that late time with us <laughs> all right we're 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 about two minutes in we've got 70 odd participants we get started very shortly about another 30 seconds or so if you've just joined do let us know where you are tuning in from in the in the chat great to hear from you more from the us more from india more from the uk Berlin, Berlin Germany, Servus. <laughs> Even though you don't really say that up there. I grew up in the South. So. Okay. Well, look, I think we've got 80 plus participants, which are great to see. I think we, we will get started. Right, Dominic? Sounds about right. Excellent. So you're all very welcome to another MongoDB webinar. This one, um, you have two hosts and also a bit of assistance from, from Brandon and, and Nia on the side as well, too, answering some of the questions. Uh, this one is all about a Unity app that Dominic, my colleague Dominic Fry, on camera there as well, too, created, and we use it to essentially illustrate the power of Atlas and the power of the connections that we have in our partner ecosystem in AWS and also what Atlas can do to help you visualize your data. So we created this quirky little game uh, that we are going to show you very shortly to show a really nifty example of kind of how to generate data and how to visualize and work with that data as well too. Um, so if you pop on to the next slide, Dominic, we'll do a bit of housekeeping first. The webinar has been recorded. Uh, we will share it. So thank you for all that have joined us so far. If you've registered, but you know for some reason or other you can't participate, it will be shared with you on a link after it's done. You're muted. Uh, too many people on board to let you get access to your microphones. So we have two ways to interact with us. You can use the chat obviously for any comments, but we're not really using the chat for questions and answers. We do have a Q&A section where you can put in your questions in there throughout the, the, this webinar, and we will try to endeavor to answer those either live or within the Q&A chat as well too. So please keep your questions for whatever you see going on on the screen between myself and Dominic, uh, in the Q&A section, it allows us to moderate that and answer those much easier there too. 
At the end, we love to know how we're getting on. So there will be a short survey to undertake. Um, and we hope to get some good feedback to help us improve and, and create more of these webinars for our audience. Uh, so there, the, that's the housekeeping. Questions in the Q&A, general comments in the chat, that's perfectly fine. Um, and for those that haven't already, do introduce yourselves, let us know where you're tuning in from. So we bump to the next slide, we'll show you quickly what we're going to run through today. Uh, we're going to shortly show you a small game demo, what Dominic built to show off the capabilities of Atlas. We're going to look at the architecture overview, how that's all pieced together and what services are talking to which other services as well too. We will illustrate the Atlas features that we have been using in this demo. Um, and then we're actually going to show you how we're piecing all of this together. So Dominic will take over at that point, essentially, and show some of the key components of how all of this was built. Um, and at the end, then we're going to share the code and resources. This is a, a public repo that anyone can contribute to, and we're more than happy to get your feedback on that as well, too. And we'll give you some links to learn more. We have quite a number of assets associated with this Leaf Steroids game that we're showing. Um, we don't have enough time on this webinar to go into huge in-depth. So we've done live streams and we've got repos and other things to share as well too. But first, let's show you what we're talking about. What is this Leaf Steroids thing? How does it work? Um, and what does it look like if you were to play it? We use these at the MongoDB events. We have a number of MongoDB.local events in over 30 cities this year. Um, so if you come to one of those, it's most likely you'll get to play this game if you happen to be. And we'll show you how to get to one of those events towards the end of the webinar as well, too. But Dominic, why don't you switch over to the game itself and explain your way through that before we look at the architecture? Sounds good. First of all, hello and welcome from me as well. And what I'm going to show you first is the game itself that we're going to look into today that will set up locally so can play around with that. For those of you who use Unity, that might be um, also a helpful start to just see how you can work with the, the connection from Unity to the game service. But consider that just a black box. So even if you're not a game developer, it's it's just one kind of demo that we'll look at and it should be valuable for you as well, even if you don't have any Unity experience. So let me just get into the game here. The first thing I'm going to do, just very simple, um, I have a list of players here. I, I created a player already, and that's also part of the repository. I'll show you that in a moment. I'm just going to choose my player here. Let me use this one. You're always trying to get yourself a better score. Yeah, it's, uh, I just have to, you know, just too competitive. <laughs> um, I'm going to post the link in a, in a moment as well, again, to the, the repository um, as soon as I show that to you. The game is rather simple. Uh, it's just basically a top-down kind of shooter game where you can shoot some boxes, collect some power-ups. Um, and there's also enemies floating around. You'll see on the screen, we got a player name, a certain amount of time that you have to move around here. In the bottom left, you'll see the score. And the players for those booth demos usually have around 60 seconds to play. Uh, we want to make sure there's as many players as, as, uh, as possible to, to actually enjoy the demo. But that's configurable. And that's also something I'm going to show you later on. The uh, configuration for this game is coming from Atlas. It's safe there uh, and gets retrieved by the game in the beginning. And by configuration, I not only talk about the time, I also talk about uh, how the scoring works, how many bullets can I shoot, how many uh, points do I get for those pellets or boxes that I'm shooting. Basically, everything that you can configure in your game, you can persist in Atlas and then on the fly retrieve to get your initial game configuration going. Um, for the game to play. So it's another five seconds here. And what's going to happen in the end then is whenever I'm done, the score gets submitted to Atlas. And we will in the end look at how that is going to look like in Atlas and what we can actually do with it, what kind of um, yeah information we can get out of it. And um, there's one tool we'll show you, which is called Charts, which is going to show you how to visualize that. That's one of the things we'll get into in a moment. But first things first. So this is the architecture, and it's really just done as an illustration of, of you know, how things come together here. So we create and treat the Unity game as a black box, as Dominic said, up there on, on the left-hand side. 
Um, and that talks back through a REST service on AWS EC2 uh, through the Atlas driver back to Atlas. And on the right-hand side, we have, when we use this at an event, users register, they sign up, they get their name. So you saw Dominic pick his name from the list of players there. That's how that's done. It's used for the registration. Um, and it's also used for the leaderboard and to show the charts at the end of the day, which we will illustrate how they're pulled together. So we work with AWS uh, using leveraging some of their services, EC2, and also private cloud, which is the relationship between what we do in Atlas and the AWS instance as well. Um, but we will detail how all of this works. Anything else to add there? I don't think so. Seems like we can get started there. Okay, so let's show a little bit of why we're using Atlas. For those that are unfamiliar, and maybe some of you are, it's great to see so many people on board this webinar. Atlas itself is our multi-region, multi-cloud developer data platform. Um, we use drivers to connect into Atlas, in order, and there's lots of other ways that you can connect. But in this instance, in this game, we use a driver. And you know we have drivers for 14 of the standard, most commonly used languages, you know, C, C Sharp, Java, Node, Python, Rust, Swift, Go, Kotlin. I might be leaving some out. PHP, Ruby, uh, TypeScript, et cetera, as well, too. So regardless of what sort of developer you are or what sort of language you use, we have a driver for you to connect uh, to Atlas as well, too. We use some of our Atlas database, our Atlas um, developer platform functions and features. One of them is Atlas Search. We use that for finding the player nickname in the web UI. You will see how we build Atlas charts uh, the dashboard that we create at the end of the game as well, too. So we have enough time in this webinar to show off these, but obviously on our developer data platform, there is an awful lot more. So for those of you not familiar with it, do check that out. So if you go to cloud.mongodb.com, you'll get straight in there. You can create a free account, uh, free forever, um, and get started with a, a proof of concept or a minimum viable product, anything that you want to test out on uh, what we call our M0 tier. It'll always be free and there's plenty of space and bandwidth and compute power there for you to get started. And you can grow from there up a number of tiers or indeed we do serverless. So if you're unsure of the use and you want to try and keep your costs low as possible, we can spin up and spin down your instances as and when we need with Atlas serverless. So definitely try and check that out as well too. If you jump to the next slide then, Dominic, um, just to show you, whet your appetite of, of what we're going to show you at the end of this, we use Atlas Charts, which is baked into Atlas to visualize a user's gameplay. Um, the game, the Unity game that Dominic's created, creates data, and that gets sent back and stored back in a collection back in MongoDB Atlas. And we can use the power of Atlas Charts to visualize that. And this is incredibly powerful for... Game developers, of course, in this instance, but pretty much anybody who wants to, uh, you know, introspect their data and look at their data and see what's happening there as well, too. We've got a number of powerful tools directly in Atlas to show that you can visualize that data. And then the next slide, just to show you where Atlas comes in, we Atlas is a database built in the document model. It's a NoSQL database. Um, so... We work on the idiom that data that works together lives together or data that's accessed together lives together. So we use Atlas to store a number of key documents associated with the game that Dominic built. We have a gameplay recording, which keeps track of everything that a player does in that game. That allows us to build a heat map that you'll see later on of where the players went in the arena. We store all the player details so that we can have them in our list and we can interact with them and you know they can come and play more and more and they can be part of the leaderboard. And then, as Dominic said at the start there, where just before he was getting playing, the game config itself is pulled directly from Atlas. So we can set the, you know, the values associated, associated with bullet damage and speed, how quickly you can rotate, how quickly you can move, et cetera, as well, too. So super powerful. And that all is pulled from our collections back on Atlas as well too. But Dominic, I think that's probably enough slideware, right? I think yeah. most of the people joining the stream want to get stuck in to see things happening. So let's get started there.
That's definitely more than enough, I'd say. Yeah, let me just start by posting the link into the chat again, just to make sure you got that. And then I saw a couple of questions already that I just want to quickly address while we're at it. Um, the Unity version we're using for this is uh, 2021. So I'm not going to use the 2022 LTS in that case. Uh, but you can upgrade for those of you using Unity, you can just upgrade it um, and use a newer version. It should work. Um, there's nothing nothing specific to 2021. That's just a version I built it on. And um, for the other two questions um, regarding AWS, that's just the way the game has been built initially. So you're referring to the architecture here, probably. Um, the game is currently deployed on AWS. By game, I mean the REST service that is used for the game and the website. You can use any other cloud provider as well. So if you want to, you can also use GCP and Azure any other provider really, because this REST service here, as we'll see in a second, is just a Python application, um, a Flask application, and the website you'll see in a moment is a, a Blazor server application. So it's rather generic and you can deploy that wherever you want to. And we'll actually do that locally on, on, on my machine here to show you how you would set it up locally on your computer as well. Um, so you're open to use whatever provider you want. It's not anything that's provider specific as uh, as of now. And the other thing about the ping, um, and if you would want to uh, use a local MongoDB, you could do that, but you don't really have to because for games where the ping is actually really important, like first person shooters, any kind of fast past games, uh, fast paced games. Um, I play a lot of Valorant and Rocket League lately, just to give you two examples um, where ping is certainly very important. You would unlikely actually have a connection to the database the whole time and uh, get and post data from and to the database um, in an ongoing manner. You most likely probably load the data that you need and keep that session open. And the communication between your game client and your, your server is very unlikely done with the REST service. It's probably going to be something like a WebSocket or anything else that can actually um, guarantee that you have a, a rather uh, fast and efficient connection. So um, that's, that's for those two questions. But first of all, let's get started. I uh, posted you the, the link into um, the chat. That's the, uh, the repository for this demo. The repository, as I said, is public. And what you'll find in the repository are three parts that you saw on the architecture slide. The game client, which is written in Unity. The game server, which is the REST server uh, that is deployed on the EC2 at the moment. That's a Python application. And as I said, the website is a, is a Blazor server application. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to grab this because I'm going to show you the whole thing. There is also um, a readme which is going to describe exactly what you have to do to set it up locally. It's just a couple of steps that you have to take. Um, and we'll go through those steps now. That's what I'm going to show you. And in the meantime, you can ask questions um, around that. And after that, you should hopefully be able to set it up yourself, run it locally, and then play around and use it as a template, get started um, with your own project. So let me get that a bit smaller. There was a question about uh, from Mohab about the flexibility to for a large number of players. This is a demo that we made, um, you know, essentially to show off the functions and features of Atlas. Of course, if you wanted to have, you know, we do have a huge amount of games companies using MongoDB to serve as their back end as well, too. So it is possible to do that. You wouldn't necessarily architect it in exactly the same way as we're doing this now. This is a, a small light demo. You would perhaps go and build, you know, more of a bespoke game server. Is that correct, Dominic? Yeah, that, there's nothing to add to that. That's exactly what it is. Um, it's it's a starting point. Um, but first, of, like I guess the most important part is not every game is the same. So even if we were to create um, an example for one specific type of game and, and, and a big number of players that would still differ in terms of architecture, depending on what kind of game you're building. Um, and specific for games that the requirements are just very, very different. And you have to adjust the, like the architecture and how you build the whole thing, depending on what kind of game you're building. Uh, I mean, you know, like there's so many different types of games, right? Um, there is just no one solution fits all. Uh, kind of thing in that case. Yeah, so and, and the key thing there is that we do have a huge amount of gaming-related customers running on MongoDB for their data store for a whole load of different kind of uh, use cases. And uh, so we, we can do the scale, most definitely. Just 
you know, this demo is a demo. Exactly. So what I've done, the first part that I've done is I just checked out the repository into a new into a new folder. Um, so just a, a, a fresh copy of the whole thing. Um, just to reiterate on that, the requirements are Python and the uh, .NET SDK uh, that you need to have pre-installed. And then the first thing before I'm actually going to get into changing the code and adjust it to connect to Atlas is I'm going to show you how to actually um, yeah, create a new cluster. If you haven't registered for Atlas before, you'll find a link here behind uh, create a new Atlas project, which is going to take you to the sign up. And after you've done that, what you'll see basically is make that a bit smaller. Um, you'll create a new organization and then you can create new projects, which in my case, obviously is empty for a start. I'm going to create a new project. I'm going to call this webinar life. And the first thing you'll uh, see here is adding members. I don't need to add any additional members. I'm going to be added automatically as a project owner. So that's fine. We can start with that. And that's basically what you will, let me make it a little bit bigger so you can see easier. That is your like default initial uh, view onto your um, newly created project. And the three services that we provide up here, that's that's your project, it's active. And the three services, the three pillars of, of Atlas, I'd like to say, are our data services, app services, and charts. We won't go into too much detail or actually not at all into app services today. We'll focus on the other two parts. The data services is um, your data, right? Your actual database and everything around that. And charts, as I mentioned earlier, is the visualization of your data. So you can actually see what's going on um, in your game or um, around your game. Let's start with that one first. And I've written that down here for you as well. So all you need is an M0 cluster, and then we need to add some data to it. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to build a new database. One of the really nice features about Atlas and one that I really want to point out is the M0 that we're going to choose here, which is all you need to get started to, to test around is our forever free tier. Um, you get 500 megabytes of storage, which for data is quite a lot, as you might know. Um, so that is a really good starting point and it's going to be free. So you can play around um, with that and create your application. I can choose my provider where I want to host this on. Um, and similar to the question earlier, I'm going to choose AWS just because I personally regularly work with that, but you can also choose Azure um, and Google Cloud as well, of course. As a region, I just usually, first of all, choose the region that's closest to me because I'm going to deploy it locally and I want to be as close as possible. Ireland is available in that list here. I'm in Ireland, so that's a good starting point. You can choose a name. I'm just going to leave it on the default here, but that's going to be your cluster name. And a cluster is the thing that's going to hold our databases later on. So first of all, I need to figure out which are cars, though. I think those are cars. Very good. Always sent to test you. You're pretty yeah, good at them at this stage. <laughs> yeah, it's like I, I had to practice a lot lately, so I got better, I guess. Two of the security features um, that are important, obviously, um, to make sure not everyone can just like play with your data is I need to create a database user to actually log into my database. I'm just going to call that webinar live as well. My password is the same for now. And the other thing that you'll need is you need to specify which IPs are allowed to connect to this um, application. Your local IP that you're working on at the moment that Atlas automatically detected will be shown down here. You can add other IPs, um, especially if you deploy a server. Um, that's obviously not going to be your local IP. You have to add that here. If you don't know that as of now and you want to just add any IP to, do, to get it tested, you can do that for now um, by, by using this uh, CIDR block notation here, 0000 slash zero. And then that's basically going to contain any IP that you want to, to allow here. But for now, I'm just going to use my own IP, my local one, so only I can actually access this cluster. And then I'm done. What happened in the meantime in the background is, and that's what's you're gonna, what you're going to see here, is a cluster got created. A cluster is always per default, the different ones, but per default, a replica set made out of three nodes. So you already get an initial um, 
uh, initial set of safety here with having a primary and two secondary nodes. That's what we call them, um, where your data is replicated and um, yeah, shared on those on those um, on those three nodes. Now, let me come back over here again and see what I have to do next is I need to create a database, right? So this one is going to call Lisaroids. One of the things you'll see up here is cluster zero is just the name that I left on default. I can actually just click into that one. And there's a couple of things I can do here. I don't want to go into too much detail for most of them. The, the interesting part for now, which is probably where it will work in, in the beginning, usually is uh, your collections, databases and collections on your cluster. So I'm going to click on this one. And now I can add my own data here. What that means is I can define my own database here. I'm going to just create a database that we'll call Easteroids. And then I need to create a collection that is called config because our game needs an initial, initial configuration, right? So this is the, uh, the collection name. There are some additional preferences here. I'm not going to go too much into detail, but you can read about them in the documentation. A kept collection um, is referring to the size of the collection. That's something I can uh, configure here. And then one of the things that we'll provide in the example, um, in the demo uh, repository here, is one example for how such a configuration should look like. I'm just going to copy that whole thing because this is the default configuration that you just saw me playing. And I can just insert documents right here in the UI, which makes it quite handy for the initial um, testing. I'm gonna go over here to the JSON view. I'm just gonna delete that whole thing and paste the document that I just grabbed from um, the repository. And you'll see there's several configurations in here. You already get automatically shown if that's a valid document or not. You saw that just a moment ago and there was a red bar down here. So if I insert that now, we got a conf config collection, and this is showing one configuration down here. Um, and round duration is 60, rotate speed is 100, lifespan is, is one. All those can be changed. You can add more. Once again, in that case as well, it's just an example. So you can add as many configuration um, properties here as you want to. It's completely up to you what you need for your game. This is um, basically giving you a starting point. I don't need this anymore. The second one that I need to create is events because uh, this whole thing is events-based. What you just saw me click here is next to the Listeroids database, there's a little plus icon to create another collection. This time I'm gonna create the events collection. And the same thing here, I got a template for the events. There needs to be at least one event for this demo to make it work. So I'm going to insert a document again over here. This document is going to be a bit simpler and smaller. We got the ID for this event is MongoDB TV. I suppose and it's worth qualifying as to why we have this events configuration as well too, is because we started this as demos at our MongoDB own events and even some of our partners events too. So you need to decide on entry to the game, what event you're participating in. So we've got a, a leaderboard and the heat map for that game, everything that you'll see in charts at the end. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't necessarily have an events. We just have a list of players. Exactly. So that's um, something that you'll see in a second because the event that I just created will show up as um, in, in the event list, which in that case, obviously is just one event, but it'll show up in the event list um, so that we can actually choose this event. So that's actually everything we need to do for now in our in our cluster, in our Atlas. And with it, with that, it's it's already set up. There are a couple of smaller um, additional settings we need to put down for the game server and the website. And then we're actually already, um, yeah, ready to run that. The first part I'm going to start with is the game server itself. So I'm going to come over here to my uh, console first, which I want to make actually a bit wider, make it a bit easier to read. Um, if I look into this, uh, we see the same structure, obviously, because that's the GitHub repository that I just cloned. Um, looks like a Windows VM running on Ubuntu. No, it's the other way around. No, it's not the other way around. That's a, it's a, just an Ubuntu host that I'm using here. 
it works the same way on uh, Windows and Mac OS. So the system that you're using uh, should not influence the should not influence the demo itself. Um, the the commands I put down here will work on on Ubuntu on Mac OS. They should also work on Windows. Um, you might have to adjust some of the things the way the uh, the Windows terminal works, but that's about it. It's other than that, it's agnostic to uh, the the whole system you're using. So what I'm going to see here, if I go into the game server, the game server, we got an environment file here, dot end file. Most of you should probably be familiar with that. Um, that is just where we define the environment or any kind of secrets or anything like that that we need um, to make the game work. There is a template file here. If I look into that template file, I'll see there is really just one thing in there, and that's what's mentioned over here is a connection string. I'll explain that in a second what that is. Um, that's the only property you need to configure to actually make the game server be, uh, be able to connect to our freshly created Atlas. And the way we do that is we're coming over here back to data services. We mentioned earlier there is something called the drivers, and the drivers are a library, an SDK, that enables you to actually connect to your Atlas cluster. And it's basically just one piece of information that the drivers need, and that is what, it, what we call a connection string, which contains your credentials, and it, cred it contains the, um, the URL or the, the identifier for, for your cluster. You can find that quite easily by coming over here, click on connect, and then you'll see there are certain different options. There are also tools like Compass, which is a really great um, desktop application to use and actually uh, inspect your data and work with your data. We also got a Visual Studio plugin and other options. What I'm going to do here for now is I'm going to choose drivers because that's the way we connect to our application, uh, with our application to Atlas rather. As Shane mentioned earlier, there is uh, a ton of different drivers by now for all the bigger languages. Depending on what you choose here, we're going to um, show you how to actually install that. And later on also, if you want to show you a code example of how that would work, I don't need that for now. Independent of what you choose here, we'll find down here a connection string. And that is what I just explained, credentials and the cluster URL to tell your drivers or to tell your application that is using the drivers where to actually find your cluster and how to log in. So I'm going to copy that over. And what I'm going to do now is I have to create an environment file by using the template. I'm just going to copy that over. The connection string in here is just a template. So you see how that should look like just to make sure you grab the right thing from, from Atlas. I can delete that here and then insert the connection string. Just make sure to substitute the password here, obviously. Otherwise, that's not going to work and then save it in the end. So that's the environment file for our game server. For those of you familiar with Python, you'll know Python, you'll know what I'm doing here. For those who are not familiar, I'm just quickly going to go through it while I'm copying this over and let it run. I'm going to create a what's called a virtual environment in Python. Um, that's basically just a, a container you work in um, for with your application. And this is the way to, to activate the virtual environment. And then there are a set of requirements that need to be installed. Those are defined in Python in a requirements.txt file. And one of the requirements is uh, we use a library called gunicorn. You can also use Flask. There are several other options um, that depends on what, what your like what your preference is and what kind of server you're implementing. For this one, we're going to use gunicorn. And one of the informations we'll pass along apart from the log level is which port it should run on. That's the important part so that we can actually in a second connect to it. And then you can see starting unicorn, uh, it's now listening on port 8000. And uh, yeah, so there's one work active. That's basically the default here. If I click on this one, what I should hopefully see is that my server is alive. What you'll see in the uh, the default application, in the application file is that the default um, or the base root is gonna return just live because we do have several other routes here. For example, if I ask for the config now, you'll see exactly the config that I just put down earlier. And um, in a moment, we'll also see the players. I'm gonna show you that as a next step. So we can actually now set up the website. I'm gonna leave this one open and running. 
I'm gonna let me make this a bit bigger so you can actually see what I'm doing. Maybe one more. All right, that should do. So now I'm gonna go back uh, into the root repository. There is, as you can see, also a folder called website. And if you look into that, uh, you find all kinds of things. Uh, as I said, it's a place or server application. Um, it is not super important that you're familiar with that because all we need to change here as well is the environment file and then just use .NET to run the application. So what I'm going to do here as well, I'm going to copy over the environment template or rather actually I can just use, let me first show you what I'm doing here. So this one looks the same because the only thing that the website needs, which also, um, if you remember this this one, um, the website also uses the drivers. So the only information that the website needs, once again, is the connection string. I'm going to make my life a bit easier because I created that file already. Just go into the game server .env and copy that over here. Now we got the same environment file here. So if I look at that, I got my connection string in here, and that's all you need to do. The only other thing then I need to do is do .NET run to build and run the application. That's going to take a moment longer than the other one. That was actually quicker than expected. I don't yeah. like that, right? <laughs> so sometimes, the, sometimes the build of those .NET applications takes a moment, but uh, I'm not going to complain about that one. And now on my local host port 5002, there is a website listening. And what I'm going to see here now is um, a player registration and login, register and login down here. You see the same event here, which is just the default um, event that I created a moment ago, which is called MongoDB TV. And I'm going to just create a user called Webinar Life and register that. So. That's looking good. For now, you're going to see that there is some information down here, which is not filled out yet, which makes sense because we haven't played yet. Mm -hmm. That's one of the next things we want to do. So I'm going to come back over here. So the part with run the website is finished. That's good. Now, let me open another one here. And I should probably change my defaults here to not make everyone wait, but that's, that's the way it is for now. For the game client, it's basically the same thing. Once again, we need an environment file because you should never check in those environment files into your GitHub repository. They contain secrets, they contain credentials. Um, so they're obviously not checked in. The game client, for those familiar with Unity, you know that there is an assets folder. Um, there are my prefabs, my materials and all that. The only important part, and once again, the same, it, um, the same way I explained it before with the .NET application, you don't need to be familiar with Unity. Um, you only need to exchange the environment template. You don't even need to install Unity itself if you want to use that specific demo, but you're not a Unity developer. I'm just going to quickly show you something over here. Um, even though I'm going to use Unity locally here to, to show that, for those who do not have Unity or do not want to use Unity or really just want to see what's happening behind that black box, because that's what it's supposed to be, you can click into the releases and the newest release is 2.0. One two, and in that release you'll find uh, pre-built versions for Linux, macOS, and Windows, and some instructions on where to put those environment files when you download the game because you still have to create the environment files and put it in there. There's just a specific folder that you have to put it into. I'm not going to go into de details here. I'm just going to use um, and show you how to just do that in Unity. So we got the assets folder. This is where my environment template is sitting. And if I look into that, that one is slightly different. Because in that case, the game client is not supposed to connect to the database directly. You would usually not want that. You have a game server in between that enables the communica communication between the game client and your database. But the thing that the, um, the game client needs to know, obviously, is where can I find my server, right? The default in here, that's just to give you an idea how that uh, environment file is supposed to look like. The default in here is going to work for now because I'm deploying locally anyway. And if you remember, I started my game server over here, gjunicorn 
passing along the uh, 8000 as a port, which is exactly why I put those defaults in here to make it easier for you. You don't even have to change anything. The only thing I need to do here is either move or copy. It's up to you. Uh, make sure that the environment file exists here as well. That's exactly what Unity will then in a second use to um, to start the game and con to connect to the to connect to the server. So the thing that I want to do here now, and that might be a bit small, bear with me. I can't actually make that bigger, but I'm actually just going to choose Webinar Life, uh, which is the repository that the, the name I chose locally for the repository, and then just Game Client. Uh, those using Unity will know that's all you have to do here, Webinar Life, and then I'm going to open this one. What I need to do on the side while this one is opening is, oh no, I already did that, <laughs> sorry. I need to create a user, but I, what, I, what I can show you in the meantime is what happened while I was creating that user, or like after I created that user, we can now see a new collection. Let me make that like Two new one, collections, right? One step bigger, two new collections, actually, that's correct. One is players. And that's exactly the player that I just created. I gave it a nickname, which is Webinar Life. Team and email, I just left the way they were, which is empty. So that's why I see a null here. And then you get a location here, uh, which depends on the event that I created. The background for that is um, a bit more complex to talk about that today because it's about uh, sharded clusters and how to actually uh, properly set them up. And one of the things you need for that is um, what's called a sharding key and the location is used for that as I said, it's not something that we can go into in the limited time today but you'll also see that uh, for yourself and the location here is identical to the location you defined in your events and every collection every document that's created in a collection also always has a property called underscore id which uniquely identifies this document there's a second collection called players unique um, this collection has been created to make accessing the data fr from this uh, global collection players easier and quicker, uh, but that's also an optimization that we'll have to go into at another point in time. Um, that's uh, yeah, a, a deeper topic about charted clusters and how to optimize them uh, for performance. So I can make that a bit smaller again. So this is my Unity game. The only thing I need to do here, because it seems to not per default get selected, is I'm going to go to the loading scene. And that's all I have to do. And now I can just start it. But let me do two things. First, make this one bigger and this one. And then you can hopefully see that a bit better. So that's what it's going to what it's gonna look like when you start it. No matter if you use the Unity client directly or the downloadable pre-built version that I just showed you, that's in the end what you should see when you start the game. We see the event that we just created, which is obviously just one, MongoDB TV. I can choose that. Um, this is part of the, the booth demo. That's why I'm gonna uh, get the welcome to MongoDB here. So you can also see the um, event name here as a, basically as a reassurance. Okay, it was loading the right event. Um, it's never a bad thing. And mm -hmm. then the next step that I'll see here is select your player. And since I've only created one player so far, with the, the website over here, I'm only going to see one player here. Now I'm just going to start that one. You get the introduction every single time, but you can just press enter to skip over it. I'm going to do that here for now to not make you watch the introduction again. And the game is obviously going to look the same because the game hasn't changed. The only thing that we've changed is, as you can see in the top left, uh, is the player webinar live. And we're now sending the data in the end to new cluster that we created. There was a question, uh, which is probably a good time to ask this. Yeah, when do great. we send the data, Dominic, from the play? Is it during the play or after the play? So for this demo, the, 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 the way this demo works, first of all, is a single player demo. It's um, one round after the, the other. And what's happening here is in, in the beginning, I load the players. To show the player list, I load the configuration when I before I start the game so that I actually can start the game. And the game itself records the information at the moment about what's happening, which means the movement, the, the, the mm -hmm. location that the player is in, shots fired, um, boxes destroyed, the information that we are interested in. And in the end, the moment the game over screen um, appears, we send 
the whole thing as one blob to the back end. Depending on your type of game, and I'm pretty sure the next question will be um, how to avoid people cheating while sending that data. Depending mm -hmm. on the type of game, that's obviously not uh, what you want. For a simple demo, that works quite well. Depending yeah. on what game it is, you could still leave it that way. In most cases, you will very likely have a communication open. As I said earlier, it's most likely going to be a WebSocket connection um, because they're rather fast. Which is what you want, and you'll have those. Uh, will you have that connection open? And the communication between client and server is usually not that the client is telling the server, "I'm in this location." Uh, the client is usually sending the, uh, the information to the server. I'm ex executing this or that in terms of direction change, fire, and whatnot. And the server is then going to decide, "Okay, this is what's going to happen. You're here," and then it's going to send the location back. Otherwise, the client would be uh, able to just choose, "Okay, where am I?" What did I just kill? What did I just shoot? Uh, how many points did I get? That's a decision mm -hmm. that the server obviously needs to make um, to avoid that. Uh, to avoid that um, the data gets um, tampered with. That's the word I was looking for. Perfect. So Excellent. I'm gonna. So we, I'm gonna we've leave. done a play now, so we're gonna see. Hopefully, the data from that play appear back. Exactly. So there's two things we'll we'll see in a moment. Um, actually, just one for he, for now here. I'm gonna make this bigger again. Uh, yet another collection has appeared here, which is what I just mentioned as the one blob that gets written at the end of a game, and that is a recording. The same thing as with the config, you can choose whatever you want to record here. The things that we've chosen are, first of all, I need to know which player has played. Um, the event that the player has played in is interesting for me in that case. And then there's two things additionally, apart from the date and time here, obviously, the, the statistics, how many bullets have been fired, how much damage has been done, how many pellets have been destroyed. The most important part was the score. And that is just like basic statistics. And then the other thing, and I'll, sh I'll show you that in a second again, and you saw it on a slide for a brief moment, is we also want to know where was the player. So we have snapshots of those positions. And you can see there's always an X, Y, and Z coordinate. And there's a lot of snapshots. I'm just going to go down a bit further because those initial ones were probably just me sitting in the, the center while I was still talking and explaining. So if you go down here a little bit further, you'll see that the co coordinates for the player moving. And that can be interesting for like many different reasons. It can be interesting to create a heat map, which we'll look into in a moment. It can be interesting to create what you might know from some games as a playback system. So you can actually play back the whole game and see what's happened, which I enjoy quite a lot, actually, because it helps you quite a lot to understand what you did in the game and what you could do better. Um, there's all kinds of information um, and, and opportunities you can take out of those um, of those snapshots. Mm -hmm. And you can save additional data to, for example, also record where are the enemies that have been moving around? Um, where were the locations for the boxes that have been shot? It completely depends on what you need for your game and what you want to save and what you want to visualize later on, because that's the interesting part. Hmm. And that is actually what I want to get into next. Are there any other questions from anyone? No, it's quite quiet at the moment. I think we've answered right. most of that's the open good. questions. I think just to bookmark for those who might be trying to keep up and see where we are at the moment. In essence, Dominic's gone through the creation of his project on Atlas and his clusters, the ones that he needed and his documents at the beginning. Then we connected up the game to the website and then we connected the game actually back to MongoDB with our connection string. And in doing so, and in playing the game, creating a player, playing the game, it's created a, a couple more documents back in MongoDB. Um, so we still don't have any insights as to what that player did. So now we're going to show you, as Dominic said, we spent some time in the data services tab. Don't have time to go through the app services in this webinar. And now we're going to show you how simple it is to take any data that you might have generated and store back on Atlas and to view that in a visual way using Atlas charts. Exactly. So... First of all, the charts tab up here. You saw it, uh, it took a moment to set up, but what you see in the end is your dashboard. Your charts dashboard consists out of um, uh, your dashboards, or like the, the, the initial view consists of dashboards. That's what I wanted to say. There you go. 
Um, you get one initial one automatically created. That's Dominic's dashboard here. And that's all I'm going to use for this demo to just quickly show you one or two things um, in charts and how to set them up. So I'm going to go into my dashboard. Inside the dashboard, those little tiles that you saw earlier and that we'll create for now are referred to as a chart. And the first thing we have to do is we actually have to select what kind of data do we want to show. There's only one cluster active in this project. So that's why this cluster is shown here. In this cluster, it's just one database active. And then we'll see all the collections that we just created. The one that's interesting for us for now is obviously the recordings collection. When you choose the recordings collection, it's going to load the structure of the collection over here. And Charts is also right away giving you a couple of ideas of what you might or might not um, want to illustrate and show in your charts. And I'm actually just going to start with the very first one here, and I'm actually going to use that to show you what that means. As I said, the fields are down here. Over here is where I define what I actually want to see. The chart type up here, in that case, is a number. You can see there's loads of different chart types, mm -hmm. and we'll look into one or two others in a moment. But for now, I just want to see some, uh, some number. And the suggestion that charts made was, let's just take the IDs. And as the aggregate, let's just look at how many distinct IDs are there. So we've seen that earlier for a moment. Let me click on Browse Collections again, close that one, and go to Recordings. As I mentioned, for every new document that you create in a collection, an underscore ID field is automatically generated with a unique ID. So what we can do if you go to charts is check those IDs and aggregate them by saying, give me the number of distinct IDs, which in other words means the amount of rounds that have been played. So I can come over here and give this one a title to make it more clear what it is. Number games played, because that's exactly what this number is representing. I'm going to click save and close. And now I'm going to get one of those neat tiles that I can move around on my dashboard. It's obviously not really super impressing for now. We have to not add only one more. in it, but yeah, it'll get yeah, there. And it's only like a simple one. So that's uh, it's maybe not the, the most interesting one. As soon as you started creating um, some charts, one other neat feature here is that charts is going to suggest you what kind of data um, you or data source you might want to use for your dashboard. We want to use the uh, recordings again. And what we're going to do next is what probably most people would be interested in is a table. And we will uh, create a leaderboard. A leaderboard obviously has to have the name of the player, which is what we move over here into the groups. So we group the table by the, the, um, the player that has been played. And then when I look into my session statistics down here, we saw earlier there's a score and the values for that, for that table make sense to be set to score. There's a couple of adjustments I want to make here, and they also show you how super easy it is to configure that whole thing. First of all, I'm going to call this leaderboard. And that is the highest score per player. And that is also an important bit of information. I mean. If you read leaderboard, you obviously assume it's the highest score, but charts doesn't necessarily know what you um, want to show here. And there's mo loads of different um, loads of different options that you can show here. The default here is sum. That's obviously not what we want. We want to always see the maximum score each player um, has gotten. Now, that looks good so far. Now, one other nice thing about charts is that you can configure how this tile is going to look like. Number one is going to be, as you can see down here, there is a total. For most tables, that's probably what you want to sum up all the numbers here. For a leaderboard, it doesn't really make sense to sum up all the no. scores that all the players have gotten. So we need to get rid of this one. And then we can just quickly do one more thing. Uh, for the fields, I can actually overwrite them. I only want this to be player. And for the sessions, I want this to be score. Needs a moment to load. That's okay. We got a question, just we might as well answer it live. Are the charts auto updating or point in time creation? 
I know the answer, Dominic. A perfect question for what I'm about to show you now, because it's exactly the next thing that I wanted to show you. So first of all, let me check that again. What did I do? Customize fields, player override. That looks good. This one looks good. Did you you don't have a table anymore? Where did it go? Yeah, I think it's just a preview. I'm gonna show you that exact thing. Uh okay over here. That's exactly what I wanted to show next. Um for this little refresh button here, you got settings. And the setting, the default is that the dashboard refreshes once an hour. Depending on what kind of dashboard you have, that might not be enough, or it might even be too fast because the data doesn't change that much. You can show it um, just statically and only refresh manually. Just the, the quickest interval we got here um, within those settings is one minute. I'm just going to choose that. But at any time, you can also say, give me a false refresh. And now the data loads, and I was just stuck for a second here. Um, once again, not super interesting, but if I play another round or register another player, um, I would see more here. And to not have to fill that manually, I'm just going to quickly, as a last thing, come over here and show you how that might look like and what you've seen on the slide before, um, before we wrap it up to, to give you an idea of how powerful charts actually is. So what I created over here, games played, um, is, is this one. So in total, we got 902 games played at the events that we've used the demo so far. And we got a leaderboard over here um, where you can sort and see the scores of all the players that have participated in those demos so far. And that can also give you an idea of what is like a typical score, what is an average score, or what is a weirdly high <laughs> score where you just know, okay, that guy must have been a cheater. Um, Shout out, so, shout out to Jesse Hall, our yeah, colleague, so, figured out how to cheat his way to the top of the leaderboard. That's what he did, and he did it very successfully. That's a, that's a really good score here. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and then a couple of other like neat features to see how many pellets destroyed and collected. But one of my most favorite features, probably the heat map, which, which shows you where are players usually, which areas of the map do they go into. And as you can see, the center of this one is a little bit more red because most players tend to stay close to the center. Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. parts are even completely white, which means no player has ever been in that area. And the other parts are all in the same kind of yellow um, because some players go there, but not all of them. And then they just move around and the coverage is relatively the same, but you can see some areas here where it's a bit more a bit more intense and that could give you a good idea. Um, of of, sir, of of sir, of those locations and the good thing about that and that's how i want to wrap it up uh is that what we said in the beginning is just the game itself is just a black box the kind of data you see here doesn't have anything to do with i mean it, it's based on a game but it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the game charts can show you all kinds of numbers for any application that you might build it can show you any kind of activity so here you see like a time-based chart any kind of activity that you might um, want to see how often is your application used at which times by how many players or users and even the heat map it might not be a game it might actually be um, a, a position in in a store or um, an application that's used with gps and people walking around so as you can see all of those uh, all of that data that is actually put back into atlas and can be visualized um, is shown here in a game but it's it's universally uh, usable and charts is a really, really powerful tool to, to visualize what's going on and be able to analyze your application and yeah, make it better and, and know what your users out there are doing. So with that, let me come back over here. Where were we? We were here. Yeah, exactly. So Thank you, Dominic. I mean, to go through all of that content so swiftly, I know that obviously there was pre-built things there, but for anybody who wants to follow along or try this at home themselves, if you go scan the QR while it's on the screen or indeed in the chat earlier, I put a link, which is really easy to remember. So mdb.link, that's our shortcuts, mdb.link forward slash leafsteroids underscore links. We'll take you to a page on our MongoDB Developer Center where you have all of the links to the repos, a previous live stream, um, the presentation, et cetera, that we have all around this. And as we said at the beginning, this is something that we use at events. 
Uh, Dominic put this together uh, a while back. We've reused it a number of times. We're always trying to improve it. So if you are a game developer or somebody in that space and you're happy to contribute and, and join in, by all means do. If you want to build out some more charts that we don't currently have, by all means do as well too. We'd love to hear from you if you can join us on that repo and, and create you know, any PRs that you want. Uh, we, the more the merrier. We have a few more, a uh, couple of minutes left maybe. If there's any other questions you want to jump in the chat or in the q and I know we're going to open up a survey now as well too. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Nia just to open out the survey um, so we can get some feedback and to improve these webinars going forward. Yeah, and just before we do that, I just wanted to, like you, you mentioned the PRs, but if you have any issues or any questions around the repository, uh, feel free to to contact us or me directly or what the most obvious way is is just open issue in the repository ask your questions um and we'll happily help you out to, to get the whole demo running for you and get started using it and trying it out okay perfect thank you both shane and uh dominic for your amazing presentation now i'm going to drop this quick poll Please let us know how today's webinar went with the amazing presentation from Shane and Dominic. Um, but before we jump into Q&A, and while you all are finishing filling out the poll, I want to invite you to attend one of our dot .local events, which might be coming to a city near you. When you attend, you will have the chance to meet with peers from this webinar with you, along with experts like Dominic and Shane. Make sure to visit mongodb.com local to learn more. When you register, enter code WEBINAR50 to save 50%. I will drop this link in the chat. Um, I will hand this over to Brandon to read some of our poll questions. I think there was uh, just one more question in the Q&A, um, Shane and Dom. Oh, okay. Do, do, do. So we answered the charts about auto update and the next one is about security with Unity. Dominic, that's your space. Any comments there? Yeah, that's a good question. I actually have to pass on that one. Um, <laughs> I'm not a security, and the reason is quite simple. I'm, I'm not a security expert in Unity. Um, and when we created the game with Unity, and I'm, I mean, I've developed with Unity before, that's why I chose this one and not, not others. Um, but the focus was not on giving an example implementation for Unity specifically. And that leads back to what we said earlier. It's, it's just meant to be a black box. It's a, a fun, playable black box, um, but it is a black box. So the, the Unity implementation is really just to show you how to actually um, connect to your cluster or connect to your, not to connect to your cluster. Sorry, that's what the game server does. Connect to your game server. Um, but it's not supposed to be a, a Unity specific example um, or template implementation um, if, like for a game that you actually create. The, the important bits where it's more an example implementation is the website and the game server and what we do on the Atlas side. So just to give you a bit of an idea what the, the background behind that is, um, but I'm unfortunately not an expert on that on that matter. Yeah, I mean, of course, on the on the MongoDB side, we we have encryption, we've got queryable encryption, we've got a, everything that you might possibly need from the security side of the, the, the house. I think, you know, we talked about game development companies using MongoDB before. We have an awful lot of financial institutions now on board using Atlas as their back end as well, too. And if anybody's worked in the financial space before, you know how hard it is to convince those sort of institutions to use anything on on the cloud and uh, they're very much on premise i want to be near it i want to be able to see it i want to be able to touch it and we've done an amazing job our team uh, in mongodb our engineering team in overcoming most of those hurdles that those financial institutions have with regard to storing data on the cloud uh, with any of our cloud partners aws gcp and azure Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Um, you give uh, any last calls for questions, um, last chance to fill out the poll. Um, we really do appreciate you taking the time to uh, give us your feedback. Let us know how we can improve um, what you enjoyed. And we will um, take that information and, and apply it to our next sessions um, and hopefully see you in person at a .local. .local.
Excellent. And thanks, everyone, for filling in the poll. I do very much would like to know who are the two people who think they can beat your high score, Dominic, in Leaf Stroids. I'd certainly what? take you up on that channel <laughs> uh, challenge. Um, two brave souls have said they're very likely to beat your score. I love that. We should probably like do a do a challenge around that, and people can send in a video of them actually playing that. Or if you have a chance, come to one of our dot locals where we show the demo. That would be another option. Yeah, well, I know like you and I know that this Leaf Stroids demo has gone down really well at the events. We have a a ton of enhancements planned for it as well too. So watch this space because there will be an opportunity to compete. Uh, in leaf stroids in some way or fashion uh, openly not just necessarily at the dot local events as well too what a tease and with that Nia, you want to close us out do you want me to tease even more there's going to be some ai stuff coming up <laughs> with the magic words yeah magic letters i should say <laughs> excellent Please continue to fill out the poll, everyone. And if Dominique, you can go to the next slide. Um... Did you know we got a podcast? It's called MongoDB Podcast. There's a lot of great content and speakers, so check it out and have a listen. We'll be sure to post the link in the chat if you haven't listened or tuned in. And as well as listening, don't forget to subscribe on whatever platform you grab your podcast from and also leave us a review please it really does help us uh, to reach our audience as well too and um yeah please do that yes well thank you all so much for attending today's webinar um we invite you to reach out and look out for an email from us with the link for the recording with the email that you registered with thank you all again thank you shane Dominique and Brandon for tuning in and please be sure to reach out and ask any questions um, to us in the MongoDB community forums as well. I will drop that link in the chat too. Thanks everyone for joining. Have a good day, good night, wherever you are. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Sure. Thank you so much.